Welcome back, everyone, to the Homeric Epic Podcast. Today's the day where we finally cover Book 9 of the Iliad, the one I've been alluding to for the past three episodes, and the book directly following the eighth book. Funny how that works. All jokes aside, Book 9 is extremely important to the plot of the Iliad, the character of Achilles, and the fates of the poem's three greatest heroes. It all turns on a dime here. Book 9 is one of the narratological peculiarities of the Iliad, with several indications that it is a late addition to the story, or at least has several new features to it. We are treated to some amazingly lifelike speeches from the characters, and, of course, I'll be going over all the tiny infinitesimal details on your behalf. Before we dive in, let me quickly recap the events of Book 8. Book 8 of the Iliad opens as Zeus summons the gods on Olympus and prohibits them from interfering in the Trojan War, threatening severe punishments for those who disobey. He asserts his supremacy with a description of his immense power, which silences the gods, save for Athena, who politely asks her father if they can provide advice to the Greeks. Zeus then oversees the battlefield for Mount Ida, balancing the fates of the Trojans and Greeks on his golden scales. The fate of the Greeks weighs heaviest and sinks the scales to their side, signaling that the Trojans will be victorious that day. Zeus sends thunderbolts amongst the Greeks, forcing their retreat. The main Greek characters are frightened from this omen and flee the battle line. Old Nestor has some trouble with his horses, as Paris has shot one with an arrow, but Diomedes comes to his rescue. The two are about to charge at Hector, but are turned away by a lightning bolt directly from Zeus. Despite Zeus's earlier warning, Hera and Athena contemplate assisting the Greeks, and even go so far as to gear up and head down to Troy, but Zeus sends Iris to sternly remind them of his decree. Reluctantly, they comply, and Hector, empowered by the very evident divine favor, drives the Greeks back toward their ships. The Trojans, emboldened by their success and their treat of the Greeks, camp outside the walls overnight to prepare for a decisive assault the next day. They burn many watchfires, ready to prevent any Greek escape. Meanwhile, the Greek leaders rally their forces, desperately trying to maintain morale amidst the fear that they might not survive the Trojan onslaught. Dang. Eight whole books, nine episodes, tens of hours worth of audio, and hundreds of hours of research. And most remarkable of all, people actually listen to this podcast. So to you out there, I thank you. If you think someone else would like this podcast, please consider leaving a like or comment, and maybe because of that, someone else will join us on this journey through Homer's epic. But before we dive into the analysis, a quick recap is in order. And I mean quick this time, as we have a lot to cover today. Book 9 opens with Agamemnon bemoaning the fate of the army. He calls an assembly together to see what should be done about those Trojans camped right outside their wall, burning the thousands of watchfires and whatnot. He initially suggests fleeing, but Diomedes finds that unacceptable. Nestor then delicately suggests that perhaps now is the time to make amends with Achilles. Agamemnon finds that very agreeable, and goes on to list the numerous treasures and gifts and enslaved women and whole towns he is willing to give Achilles if he would return to the fighting and save them. To deliver the message, Nestor picks three envoys. First up, obviously, is Phoenix. Remember him? No? Oh yeah, this is the first time we ever hear of him. Okay, so who else? Odysseus and Telamonian and Ajax. The three of them set out to Achilles' camp, and when they arrive, Achilles is overjoyed to host his closest friends to a meal. After they eat, Odysseus raises a toast and then tactfully lists the gifts Agamemnon is willing to give to him if he returns. Achilles responds to the offer with an amazing burst of raw emotion and characterization, explaining emphatically why he will not return to fight for Agamemnon. Next to try to convince Achilles is Old Phoenix, who, as it turns out, is sort of Achilles' godfather and helped raise him growing up. He launches into the longest continuous speech in the entire poem, detailing three paradigmatic stories to try and convince Achilles to forgo his destructive rage. Achilles responds, but is still unwilling to rejoin the fight. Finally, Great Ajax speaks up and makes a final comment, but to no avail. The three envoys leave Achilles' tent empty-handed, and not much really happens. They return to Agamemnon to report the bad news, and the book ends. Now I know what you're thinking. How could this book be so important? Why have all the previous books been pointing towards it? Especially when nothing seems to really happen. All in due time, dear listener, so let's dive in. The book opens with a particularly graphic, yet 
strange-feeling simile, relating the Greeks' fear to Zephyr and Boreas, the west and north winds, respectively, stirring up the fish-filled water in a stormy sea, churning the seaweed up from the depths. The choice of vehicle for this simile is a strange one, but I think has to do with the context of the ocean. The sea in both the Iliad, and more so the Odyssey, is referred to as a dark and dangerous place. The Odyssey is full of ships wrecked by Poseidon's wrath, and the Iliad uses the imagery of the sea in other books in a negative light as well, namely in Book 21 where Achilles fights a river. And the ancient seafaring Greeks were well aware of the dangers of Poseidon's realm, there were literally hundreds of island city-states across the Aegean, and a corresponding number of temples to appease the tempestuous sea god. So the comparison here doesn't feel like it's between the Greeks' fear and the imagery invoked of the sea through the simile, but rather the fear also felt in such a situation at sea. Foreboding, dread, imminent demise, like you're aboard a ship in a storm. You don't know what will happen to you in the next few moments. Thus, the tone is adequately set. Agamemnon is worried enough about the predicament to call an assembly, and he addresses the Greek captains. He explains to them how Zeus must be against them, how their situation is so dire, and then he suggests that they should all sail home, and that they will not take the spacious streets of Troy. The poet notes especially his dark tears streaming down his face, like a stream wetting the side of a mountain. It feels like this reaction is undeserved, because it sort of is. The Trojans have not yet breached the wall, and out of the two days of battle, only the one yesterday was one-sided, what with Zeus's lightning bolts. So is Agamemnon's reaction extreme here? Within his character, no, it is not. We have already seen his extreme reactions before, his seizing of Achilles' prize somewhat unnecessarily, his poor attempt to trick the army, and his haphazard appraisal of the troops, and now this. Agamemnon's reaction here is thus not the general sentiment of the army, which we shall see in the next few verses, but it is his own sentiment. We are meant to see the king beaten down, feel his fear, so that when he states the lengths he is willing to go to appeal to Achilles, we can be absolutely sure that he means it. The first to pipe up against Agamemnon's brash suggestion is young Diomedes. He, apparently, has not forgotten the insult, that Agamemnon made to him about his courage back in Book 4, when Agamemnon was inspecting the troops. Keep in mind that this was only the day before in the story, as Book 8 brings the second day of fighting to a quick close, so it is no wonder that the wound is still fresh for Diomedes. He uses Agamemnon's insult as the justification for his current, slightly subordinate outburst. Diomedes says Agamemnon's plan is nonsense, and that Zeus may have given him authority, but he did not give Agamemnon courage. He could go home with his many ships, and Diomedes and his pal Stenelus will stay and take Troy together, just the two of them. This sentiment, that a pair of close comrades would want to take Troy, just the two of them, is exactly the same one expressed by Achilles about Patroclus in Book 16. Achilles desires that only he and Patroclus survive the Greeks and gain all the glory of sacking Troy just for themselves. In the present context, it reinforces the Diomedes' surrogacy for Achilles with his outburst against Agamemnon. They're both young hotheads with a disdain for the incompetent authority figures, and perhaps having stand in Achilles, disagree with you, is a bit of foreshadowing for how the real Achilles will react to Agamemnon's distress. Anyways, the Greeks shout their assent, and wise Nestor steps in with his honeyed words. He applauds Diomedes for his sound judgment of the situation, but faults him because his words do not reach a conclusion. This is the second major time that Diomedes has been on display exchanging words with the other Greek captains, the first time being in Book 4 when Agamemnon insulted him. And we will hear from Diomedes again later in the story, and it seems that he has taken Nestor's words to heart there's a noticeable improvement in the suggestion he gives later. This is congruent with the Homeric ethos that the most excellent warrior is strong in battle and good in council. Nestor goes on to say that they should station extra guards this night as the Trojans might be tempted to attack, and that Agamemnon should host them in his tent for a meal. Like any good leader, Nestor is focusing on what can be done in this situation instead of worrying like Agamemnon. Plus, once everyone is nice and full, he can propose his true idea, having Agamemnon make amends with Achilles. But there's one point in the middle of Nestor's first speech here that is worth highlighting. It is 
quote, Without tribe, lawless, without home is that man who desires cold-blooded war among his own people. End quote. The context is that he's saying this to Agamemnon, because surely Agamemnon will not fault his words, and is certainly not without tribe and lawless. It's verbal defense on Nestor's part by openly stating the good intentions of his possible opponent, and sort of making his mind up for him. But can you think of anyone who has desired war among his own people? That's right, Achilles. His wish was that the Greeks pay for taking his prize with their own lives by being beaten in war. It seems like Nestor's cognizant of this, and that he doesn't expect Achilles to actually want this, and that he is likely amenable to an apology from Agamemnon. But asking Agamemnon to apologize is a bit of a risk on Nestor's part. Remember, in Book 1, Agamemnon was equally as angry with Achilles. But Nestor has judged the situation correctly. He can see the great king's distress. His second speech starts by restoring Agamemnon's authority in the light of those assembled, and with great tact, he reaches his final point. Agamemnon, you should make amends with Achilles. The hesitation and fine maneuvering by Nestor was unnecessary, it seems, as Agamemnon is dejected enough to immediately agree with him. He goes on to enumerate the gifts he will give to Achilles if he will rejoin the fighting, but he begins his speech in a rather peculiar way. Quote, Old one, not at all falsely have you recounted my delusion. I was struck with delusion. I myself make no denial. Worth many warriors is the man whom Zeus loves in his heart, as now he honors this one, and brings defeat to the Achaean people. But since I was struck with delusion, guided by my wretched sense, I am willing to make amends and to offer untold recompense. End quote. So there are some subtle things going on here. You probably noticed the three times the word delusion is used by Agamemnon. The Greek word is ate, and it has come up once already in the poem, in the beginning of book two, which we covered in episode three. To recap, Ate, or delusion, is a personified spirit or deity that afflicts mortals with poor judgment or reasoning, deluding them into acting in ways that they normally would not. Agamemnon is claiming here to have been afflicted such, and that he recognizes the effects of Ate now. But notice the difference. Agamemnon is externalizing the responsibility of his actions onto an outside force. He's not admitting that it was wrong for him to take Briseis from Achilles only that the action was caused by delusion and therefore wrong. Remember this distinction as we move through the book. But first, let's dive into the many gifts that Achilles can expect to receive. Agamemnon lifts out the gifts like it's the 12 days of Christmas. Listen. To all of you, I will enumerate the illustrious gifts. Seven tripods untouched by fire, ten talents of gold, twenty gleaming cauldrons, Twelve horses, muscular, bears of prizes, who won contests with their speed of feet. End quote. It continues for some lines. Interesting highlights include seven women from Lesbos, whom Achilles captured himself and was likely forced to give to Agamemnon. Returning them now seems a bit on the nose, don't you think? Agamemnon also says he will return Briseis. Strange he didn't lead with this one. He then goes on to say that when they sack Troy, he may take his pick of the spoils and enslave the 20 most beautiful women of his choosing. Next, he says after they return to Argos, he will make Achilles his son-in-law by letting him marry one of his daughters, and he will give him seven cities to reign over. And to cap it all off, he ends his speech with, quote, Let him give way. Hades is implacable and unyielding, and therefore is for mortal men the most hateful of all the gods. Let him submit to me, since I am the greater king, and since I claim myself to be in age the elder. End quote. Did you catch that? Since I am the greater king. Do you think Achilles is going to like that last part? Well, we'll find out shortly. The reaction from Nestor makes it clear that this is an extraordinary amount of wealth Agamemnon is willing to give to Achilles. Nestor then orders the message to be delivered by three characters. He mentions Phoenix first an unknown character up until this point, and seldomly mentioned afterwards, along with Odysseus and Great Ajax. Now here is where things get interesting. Well, interesting if you're into oral poetic theory and the evolution of ancient epic poems as evidence from fragments of archaic grammar left in a dead language. But you are here, so I'll assume that you are. 
When the three heroes, hereafter referred to as the embassy, are selected to bring the message to Achilles, the poet refers to them in a very strange way. In ancient Greek, verbs can refer to three different numbers of things, singular, plural, and dual. The analogy in English is like the difference between saying I am and we are. But the dual form would be akin to having a specific way to use the verb to be to say something like we too is. The verb would change form to reflect this dual number, making it clearly identifiable as referring to exactly two subjects. It's often used to denote pairs of things, eyes, hands, two horses together. It was very commonly used for pairs. So when Phoenix and Odysseus and Ajax and the two heralds Odios and Eurybates set out to Achilles' tent, the poet refers to this group in the dual form. Caroline Alexander translated it as, and the two groups went, while the older Richmond Lattimore translation uses, so these two walked. And the very recent, but very good, Emily Wilson translation has it simply as, they walked. Very cool, right? Well, not yet. What is the actual problem here? First off, grammatically, it doesn't make sense to use the dual form here because there are more than two people walking. So why is it included then? Some scholars think the dual form here is retained from an earlier version of the Iliad when only Odysseus and Ajax went to Achilles' tent. That way, if the two heralds accompany them, it can refer to the two groups or simply the two of them. The evidence for this is in the strange introduction of Phoenix. We haven't heard of him until this point, and he's clearly not an important captain. And as we shall soon see, if he's so close with Achilles, why isn't he already at Achilles' tent anyways? It's a bit of an awkward thing to explain. Thus, some scholars theorize that the character of Phoenix was invented by the poet, possibly by whoever we call Homer, and included in Book 9 to enhance the tale, but Homer forgot to take it out or didn't want to alter the original dual forms of the verb. If this were the case, what would the embassy look like without Phoenix? Unfortunately, if we remove him from the equation, the remaining speeches delivered to Achilles feel very awkward, and the natural balance of the scene is ruined. The book itself definitely feels like it was intentionally designed with Phoenix's contribution in mind, so maybe the duels are just the awkwardness we should expect when introducing a new character to a poem with so many stock formulas and phrases. Other theories contend that the dual form was not widely used in the Ionic dialect of Greek around Homer's time, around 700 BC, we think. And the Alexandrian scholar Zenodotus, whom we have to thank for so many marginal notes in our Iliad manuscripts, he contends that the dual can be used interchangeably with the plural. Further supporting evidence for this is the Homeric Hymn to Apollo, which is an origin story about Apollo that was attributed to Homer in ancient times. It's also written in Dactylic Hexameter, just like the Iliad and Odyssey. In it, the dual form is used three times to refer to plural things. With this sort of rule-breaking apparently commonplace in writing of the time, a different theory emerges. Perhaps the duals were not as rigid as we think they are, and instead were used interchangeably with plural forms, or to lend an air of old-fashionedness to the text. There are certainly many anachronisms in the Iliad, so perhaps the incorrect use of dusty old grammar is just another way that the poet makes his poem feel older. There are many other theories, such as a different version where Phoenix went ahead to Achilles separately to let him know what's up, or that the duel distinguishes between the heralds and the three more prominent characters, or that it distinguishes between Phoenix and Odysseus and Ajax or that the poet added Phoenix as a character later and just forgot to change the dual forms back. This conundrum is not helped by Achilles' greeting when they arrive at his tent, when he employs the dual form again. Translated very crudely, it reads, quote, Greetings, you two. You two have arrived, dear friends. End quote. Much ink has been spilled on the problems of the duels in Iliad Book 9 but it is just one of the peculiarities of a story that has been both wholly oral and wholly written, and honestly just adds to the enduring mystery that is Homer and his epics. We'll leave the grammatical nitpicking here and follow the embassy to Achilles' tent. They arrive to find Achilles relaxing, and relaxing while doing something very specific. The text reads, quote, 
And so they came to the shelters and ships of the Myrmidons, and found him delighting his heart in a pure-toned lyre, exquisitely wrought, with a bridge of silver upon it, which he won from spoils when he lay waste to the city of Aetion. With this he was delighting his spirit and singing the glorious deeds of men. Patroclus by himself was sitting opposite in silence, watchfully waiting Aeacides, for when he would break off his singing. End quote. Firstly, when we last left Achilles, he was weeping and beseeching his mother to help because of the dreadful dishonor he felt was made against himself. Since then, numerous references to his wrath have been dropped by characters on both sides, such that the wrath pervades all characters in all parts of the poem. So when the embassy arrives to find Achilles sitting, playing music, and singing, and then when he jumps up and says, quote, Welcome! Surely you come as dear friends. Indeed, there is great need, who are dearest to me, even in anger, the Achaeans. End quote. Our hopes are aroused that they may yet come to an understanding. The cordiality of Achilles is only on the surface, as we shall soon see. Secondly, about this scene is the significance of Achilles playing the lyre and singing the Clea Andron, translated as the glorious deeds of men. Here we find a hero sitting idly, singing the songs that have made other heroes famous, while he himself is not out performing deeds by which others will sing songs about him to continue his fame. All of this taking place within the story that makes Achilles famous. It's highly meta. The poet performing to his audience the scene of Achilles singing epic songs shows just how legendary the craft must have been considered. Remember, the literal goddess of epic poetry is invoked several times throughout the Iliad. This would give the poem a divine authority and aura that we certainly cannot understand. Besides the meta-ness of it, Achilles singing the Clea Andron insists upon one of the key themes of the poem, that the only immortality available to you is your Kleos, or that which is sung about you after you die. Achilles is acutely aware of this and is shown here perpetuating the songs of those who came before him. Last comments on this scene, Patroclus, who sits opposite of him, will continue the song that Achilles is singing from where he leaves off. We have evidence of epic poetry being performed in rounds such as this from the 6th century in Athens during the reign of the tyrant Pisistratus. He championed the arts and tried to produce a definitive version of Homer and also had the rhapsodes perform one after another, starting where the previous one had left off. And finally, the lyre Achilles is using came from the city where Eation, Andromache's father, ruled, where Achilles slew all her brothers and her father on the same day. This adds another layer to the meta. Was there a song sung about Achilles' great victory against Eation? In a way, there is, for the lyre survives, and Andromache's memory of her father survives, and lives on through this poem. After Achilles' enthusiastic reaction to the arrival of the embassy, we read another type scene of feasting and toasting. I always found this funny because Odysseus and Ajax and Phoenix literally just came from Agamemnon's tent where they had had another hearty feast. But the meal set out by Achilles is embellished upon more than the first one hosted by Agamemnon, no doubt to increase the suspense. Still, it appears like the characters have had two gigantic meals back to back. Then again, though, they are fighting all day long, but I digress. The transition from feasting towards the matter at hand by the embassy is telling. First, Ajax wants to hand the reins off to Phoenix and does so with a nod that he thinks is subtle. Phoenix doesn't notice this, but Odysseus intercepts the signal, confident that only he can deliver the message correctly. And so Odysseus launches into his speech. He begins with a toast to Achilles, stating that they have no lack of feasting in Agamemnon's tent, nor in Achilles, casually implying that they have just come from Agamemnon's tent. Odysseus knows that mentioning Agamemnon too forcefully may anger Achilles, and so he mentions him in this oblique way. He also mentions the equality of the feast they have received from Agamemnon and Achilles here, which could be perceived as a compliment here, but is not likely to be taken as such by Achilles. The intro to Odysseus' speech is logical, sensical advice. He lays out the situation clearly. The Trojans are camped outside the wall, and Hector rages. They are afraid of them breaching the wall. 
This is a situation up until now that Achilles is aware of, but is refusing to take part in. Odysseus then says, quote, For you too there will be grief in time after, nor is there any means to find remedy once evil is accomplished. End quote. Odysseus means that if the Trojans break through the wall, they will kill many Greeks, and Achilles cannot undo this if he rejoins the fighting too late. But what even Odysseus doesn't know is that this statement anticipates the death of Patroclus. Achilles' rage at Patroclus' death is due in part to his inability to change the outcome of his friend's death after the fact, and the remorse he feels for it. No matter what he does, there is no remedy to the evil of death once it is accomplished. Next, we are told a small story by Odysseus about when Achilles' father Peleus sent him to Agamemnon at the beginning of the war. Peleus said to Achilles, through the mouth of Odysseus here, quote, My child, strength of body Athena and Hera will give you, if that is their will. But your great-hearted spirit is for you to restrain within your breast. Friendship is far better. It sits from strife that creates only evil, and they will honor you more, youths and elders of the Argives alike. End quote. It is implied that Odysseus was there with Agamemnon and overheard this. And how lucky he was. The advice Peleus gave to his son is extremely relevant right now. And Odysseus brings this up so that if Achilles were to reject Agamemnon's offer, he is effectively rejecting the advice of his own father. This is the perfect segue for Odysseus to launch into the list of gifts Agamemnon is willing to give should Achilles return. And so he does. The list is recounted in full, much like other messages the characters deliver in the poem. This doubles the force. The words are worth repeating because they carry so much weight, so much importance. And Odysseus recounts the gifts word for word, not missing anything. Well, actually he omits three lines right at the end. The ones I quoted just earlier that ended, Let him submit to me since I am the greater king. Odysseus the tactician, the man of many twists and turns, knows better than to include such hubristic, unnecessary boasts in a delicate diplomatic mission such as this. And so, like a good messenger, he alters the contents to try and obtain the objective he was set out with. This is the poet playing with the Homeric style. Repetition was used by the poet to emphasize, heighten, and ennoble the words, but also because it's easier to remember. And note the alteration right at the end. The omission adds so much depth to Odysseus, Achilles, and Agamemnon, and the poet locates it at the perfect spot in the list such that the audience would catch it when listening live, and so it would be easy to remember to remove from Odysseus' speech while the poet is composing on the fly. Truly, truly brilliant. Odysseus caps off his speech with a final flourish, stating that even if these gifts are not enough and Agamemnon is still hateful to you, think of the army. Odysseus says Achilles would win great glory in their eyes if he killed Hector, who is claiming that no man is his equal. This is obviously meant to prick Achilles' pride and show him that he certainly would bring great glory to himself while simultaneously helping the army. With this, Odysseus rests his case. I'd like to point out that this is meant to be framed as a virtually irrefusable offer. The wealth Agamemnon has offered Achilles is staggering, and Odysseus has offered Achilles a way to rejoin the army and gain glory while accepting the gifts as an added bonus. Well, Achilles' reply to this, in my humble opinion, is the most remarkable speech of the entire poem. It is, in essence, the manus of Achilles, that is, the rage. There is so much in this speech alone. So before I dive into the details of it, I will bring up some very general thematic things about it. Firstly, this speech is truly the linchpin of the whole poem. Inasmuch as the poem is about Achilles' rage, and Achilles' rage is defined in this speech. You can feel his anger warming, swelling, growing, blown this way and that, flaring and fading throughout. He seems to have thoughts pop into his head that change his course as he's speaking. It is the speech of a real person. And secondly, Achilles uses the language of Homer like no other character. This was noticed by the ancient commentators who left their thoughts in the margins of the oldest manuscripts, 
as well as by Renaissance and modern scholars. One such modern scholar was Adam Perry, the son of the famous scholar Milman Perry, who did the foundational work on oral poetics with the bards in Yugoslavia that I discussed in the first episode. Adam Perry's theory for the reason for Achilles' unique use of language is that the bard must use the formulas and meter that has been passed down to him by the bards who came before him. And this Homeric formula and meter so presupposes the heroic code that is espoused by all the other heroes that Achilles cannot get away from it. So how can you critique the heroic code that is defined by the forms of speech which assume it to be true? We'll actually need the context of Achilles' speech to analyze this further, so I'm going to loop back to this. I hope you're a little primed and ready for Achilles' speech. I'll be moving through it rather slowly because there is so much to touch on here. Achilles first sets out carefully, but forcefully at the beginning of his long speech, explaining he will say his decision now, and thus it will be accomplished. Quote, For hateful to me as the gates of Hades is that man who hides one thing in his mind but says another. End quote. It's a line that can be taken so many ways. Obviously, it is said in response to Odysseus, and for those of you who have read the Odyssey, you know Odysseus is famous for his ability to lie. He lies throughout the entire story. Now, this is certainly one position you can take, that Achilles thinks Odysseus is trying to cheat him in some unforeseen way. But if we take a look at the speech just so delivered, Odysseus has omitted something, the small bit at the end where Agamemnon suggests Achilles bow down to him. I personally wouldn't say he's lying to Achilles. He has relayed the heart of Agamemnon's message, that he is willing to go to such extreme lengths to have Achilles return. I do like it, though, how Odysseus the liar of the Odyssey is anticipated in this line in the Iliad, though. His characterization between the two books is remarkably consistent. So is Achilles speaking with reference to Agamemnon, then? Possibly. Perhaps he senses something in Agamemnon's message that he doesn't like. Perhaps it is that whenever a gift is given that is so enormous, doesn't it make the giver of the gift look better than the receiver? And isn't that what Achilles is angry about? That his honor should be greater than Agamemnon's? By accepting this, air quotes, gift, he is in a way giving glory to Agamemnon, who is in a position to give away women, gold, and even cities. Maybe Achilles feels that even if he accepted, his honor would not be where it should be relative to Agamemnon's. I am of the opinion, though, that Achilles does mean these things, but he is chiefly speaking to himself here. This statement is the standard to which Achilles holds himself. He has decided, and it would be hateful to him as death itself not to speak his mind. We see Achilles act this out at other points in the book, one case even going so far as to warn someone not to make him angry because he may lash out. To subdue his feelings and not act on them just isn't Achilles. He continues, Agamemnon will not persuade him, nor the other Danaeans, because there is simply no thanks for doing battle without respite. Then, quote, The fate is the same if a man hangs back and if he battles greatly. In equal honor are both coward and warrior, and they die alike, both the man who has done nothing and he who has accomplished many things. End quote. Achilles here is lamenting the effort of battle, for the result is the same in his eyes, especially after Agamemnon has slighted him. What's the point of fighting anymore? You die anyways. He continues with an interesting simile. Quote, As a bird to her unfledged young brings in her mouth whatever she catches, but for herself it goes badly. So I too have passed many sleepless nights and come through many blood-soaked days of fighting, doing battle with men who fight for their own wives. End quote. Very bleak outlook. And note the tone of the mama bird simile. It does not emphasize the care the mother bird has for her young, instead emphasizing that the mother bird suffers because of her position. Achilles thinks himself foolish for his efforts thus far, and feels he's gotten no thanks for feeding the army and Agamemnon. 
and listen to the final three lines. Sleepless nights, blood-soaked days of fighting. Fighting men who fight for their own wives. I love that description. Blood-soaked. And it translates very well. The Greek is haimatoes. The root haima is where we get heme and hemoglobin from. And it's got a suffix on it that makes it an adjective. Just fantastic. And the last line. Doing battle with men who fight for their own wives. Achilles has before been cognizant of the innocence of the ordinary Trojan soldiers, as in Book 1 he says it was not on account of the Trojan spearmen that he came to Troy. Achilles is aware enough to recognize that the men he faces have not done him personally any wrong, and it seems now that he is fully aware of the futility in fighting them any further. Achilles goes on to say that he has sacked 12 cities by ship and 11 more by foot in the previous nine years of the war. And from all of these, he carried off treasures and gave them to Agamemnon, who would distribute them. His rage bursts forth here in a series of short rhetorical questions. Quote, Let him lie with her and take his pleasure. But why must the Argives be at war with the Trojans? Why did the son of Atreus assemble and lead an army here? Was it not for Helen of the lovely hair? Do the sons of Atreus alone of mortal men love their wives? No, for any man who is decent and wise loves her who is his own and cares for her, as I too love this one from my heart, spear one though she be. Unquote. Before I elaborate further, I will loop back to the ideas of Adam Perry as expressed in his essay, The Language of Achilles. The thesis here is that Achilles has no language with which to express his newfound disillusionment towards heroic society with. Adam Perry sums it up concisely in the language of Achilles, which I will quote here. Homer, in fact, has no language, no terms in which to express this kind of basic disillusionment with society and the external world. The reason lies in the nature of epic verse. The poet does not make a language of his own. He draws from a common store of poetic diction. This story is a product of bards and a reflection of society, for epic song had a clear social function. Neither Homer, then, in his own person as narrator, nor the characters he dramatizes, can speak any language other than the one which reflects the assumptions of heroic society. End quote. So how does Achilles express ideas that the language he is using is unable to express? Adam Perry says, in light of the part of Achilles' speech we just heard, quote, Yet, Achilles expresses it, and in a remarkable way. He does it by misusing the language he disposes of. He asks questions that cannot be answered and makes demands that cannot be met. End quote. Misusing the language. That is why Achilles' speech is so unique. Another reason that it is unique is because it sounds unique. Unfortunately, it doesn't shine through in English as well in Greek, but the poetics through which Achilles is expressing himself here is unique in all of Homer. You can kind of see it come through in a more literal translation. This one here is lifted from Mark W. Edwards' book, Homer, Poet of the Iliad. Quote, Let him lie with her, in rapture. Why must fight with Trojans, Greeks? Why has he collected and led here his host, Atreus' son? Was it not for lovely Helen? Alone do they love their wives among mortal men, Atreus' sons? End quote. All of the sentences finish as the first word of a new line, often ending as a question or with special emphasis. And this pattern right here is unique in all of Homer. There is nothing else like this. Achilles is pushing the limits of Homeric epic language to try and express his wrath, which Homeric language is unfit to describe. It literally goes beyond words. This is what is meant by Achilles misusing the language. The thoughts he wants to express simply do not fit into the words on the page that the poet has written for him. Well, what is Achilles actually saying? Well, simply put, Achilles is accusing Agamemnon of stealing his woman, which is the whole reason they came to Troy in the first place, to retrieve a wife that was stolen. 
This great irony is not lost on Achilles, and while it does explain his rage initially, it is not enough to explain why he doesn't yet accept the return of Briseis from Agamemnon. With this rather flimsy justification for his wrath hanging in the air, Achilles jabs at the embassy, taunting them. He says, look at the wall you have built. Despite this, it will not stand up to Hector, the same Hector who fled from doing battle with Achilles in the past, he tells us. Achilles elaborates in casual detail how tomorrow he and his men will set out on ships and the embassy can watch them row away if they like, so indifferent he now is to their circumstance. After the third day of rowing, he will return home with all the wealth he has gained thus far at Troy and add it to his already substantial wealth home in Phia. Now, a side note on the etymology of the name Phia. Phia is a town or district in ancient Thessaly, part of northern Greece, and was home to Achilles' men, the Myrmidons. The name Phia is very close to the ancient Greek word Phino, which means to waste away or to perish. The word connotes a gradual, slow decline, and this anticipates Achilles' choice of destiny that was revealed to him by his mother. If he stays in Troy, his life will be short but glorious, but if he returns to Phthia, his life will be long. He will be forgotten, and he will waste away and perish. This choice of Achilles' destiny is encapsulated in the simple name Phthia, where by choosing to return home, he is choosing to waste away without glory. God, I love wordplay. Next, Achilles gives the embassy a message that they can deliver to Agamemnon in response, the purpose of which is so that the other Achaeans too will scorn Agamemnon. Achilles continues to insult Agamemnon, calling him a cheat, shameless, a dog. He states he will never join him in council, he hates his gifts, and he holds him the weight of a splinter. The tone of this following passage is intense. Achilles' wrath has boiled over and his thoughts have returned to the overwhelming feeling of his hurt. Listen to this here in light of the previous passage where he was detailing his return home rather calmly. Quote, His gifts are hateful to me. I hold him at the value of a splinter. Not if he gave me ten and twenty times as much as he now owns. And if more were to come from other quarters, not as much as is brought into Orchomenos or Egyptian Thebes, where the greatest abundance of wealth lies stored in houses, and which has a hundred gates, and through each two hundred men march forth with horse and chariot. Not if he were to give me as many gifts as there are grains of dust or sand. Not even then would Agamemnon persuade my heart before he pays me back for all this heart-grieving outrage. End quote. What Achilles is saying is there is no conceivable value in the world that is enough for Agamemnon to pay him. It just does not exist. Achilles says his father will find him a wife and that his life is worth more than all the wealth in Troy and at Apollo's oracle at Delphi, which historically was known to be very wealthy. And finally, he comes to the end of his speech which I simply must quote in full because it truly ties together all the things he has said thus far. Quote, Cattle and fat sheep are carried off as plunder. Tripods are for the getting and tawny high-headed horses. But the life of a man does not come back, not by plunder, not by possession, once it passes the barrier of his teeth. For my mother tells me, the goddess Thetis of the silver feet, that two fates carry me to death's end. If I remain here to fight around the city of the Trojans, my return home is lost, but my glory will be undying. But if I go home to the beloved land of my father, outstanding glory will be lost to me, but my life will be long, nor will death's end come on me swiftly. And I would advise the rest of you to make sail for home, since you will never see the fated end of lofty Ilion, for sure it is that over it far thundering Zeus stretches his protective hand, and its people are now bold. End quote. Achilles' final grievance that he has with Agamemnon, the one that fuels his rage that cannot be quenched, is this. His new outlook on life, that it is precious and valuable, quote, but the life of a man does not come back once it passes the barrier of his teeth, end quote. 
This appreciation for life, the newfound futility of a war fought on behalf of a man trying to retrieve his wife against men trying to protect their wives, causing he himself to lose his wife. The fact that the same fate is given to the one who accomplished many things and the one who accomplishes few. The same fate for the brave and the cowardly. All these grievances he bears against Agamemnon, producing a reaction to Agamemnon's gifts that the embassy could not foresee. The two groups simply do not have the same worldviews anymore. In effect, Achilles feels that Agamemnon is asking him to sell his life with these gifts. Achilles knows that if he stays and fights, he will die even sooner, and he'll die anyways, so what's the point anymore? A long life is therefore the much more attractive option in Achilles' eyes. He has seen once how such gifts can simply be taken away. The heroic code that the embassy operates within and tries to propitiate him with has already been proven a farce. There is no chance for glory left in Troy. Agamemnon has shown that with his actions in Book 1. He has destroyed the meaning of heroic endeavor. While there is so much more to say on Achilles' speech, and so much more to say on Book 9 in general, I will have to leave the tale here for this episode and resume it in the next. Which is good, we're about halfway through Book 9, And I'm already way over my usual script length. Just goes to show you how dense book 9 is. With that, I hope you'll join me for the next episode, covering the second half of book 9. We'll hear the longest speech of the whole poem, even longer than this one, and it's told by Old Phoenix, covering some fascinating mythological stories. We'll also hear from Achilles twice more, and Telamonian Ajax as well. Finally, we'll cap it all off with a general overview of book 9. As always, though, if you enjoyed this podcast and want to hear even more, please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts, or follow me on Substack to get all the episodes and anything else I find interesting on the Homeric epics, all for free. Until then, erostai akustoi philoi.